Welcome to episode three of the Gluttons for Punishment podcast, or GFP, a Toronto Maple Leafs podcast hosted by Michael Lapore and Anthony Bruno. He's Lapore. I'm Bruno. Thank you so much for listening and watching us on YouTube as well. After seven games, the Leafs are five and two and sit in second place in the Canadian division behind the Montreal Canadiens. Last week, we were pretty tough on the Leafs, even though they went two and one. Yeah. And this week, they did pretty well again. They were three and one. So like I said, they're five and two. We'll get into the week that was, give you our thoughts and opinions on everything that went down with this team. But first, Lapore, besides being pissed off that Tom Brady is going to another Super Bowl, uh, how you doing, man? I'm good, man. Thanks for uh, starting the uh, podcast out to, in, uh, to put me in a bad mood, Bruno. I appreciate that. Uh, but can I ask you, Bruno, uh, how uh, cold is it in Toronto right now? It's not that cold. It's not that cold? It's it's, it's really, I mean, it was cold the last couple of days. It, it's been like below zero, but like nothing, nothing crazy. Holy How's shit. We're, in Ottawa? We're, we're freezing over here, man. I was in line at Costco yesterday and uh, yeah, we're lining up outside. That's the world that uh, we live in right now. And my hand started bleeding. <laughs> it was, <laughs> it was so cold. Like I'm not, I'm not tough when it comes to weather, but man, my hands were feeling it, man. Like it is cold. Like let's get this over with. I am, I am done. I'm officially done by, uh, by mid to end of January. Michael Lepore is done with winter. Thanks. Lepore. Thanks Canada. I appreciate it. Lapore, hasn't your wife taught you to moisturize your hands? What I do, do you uh, but I moisturize every night. I'm uh, not okay. afraid to, uh, not ashamed to admit that I moisturize every night. But man, the frozen tundra of the capital of Canada is too much uh, for the sensitive skin sometimes. Oh God, it's brutal out there. If it wasn't for my girlfriend, my hands would be in shambles because I've been moisturizing as well. <laughs> so, oh man. They always got hurt. it in their purse, right? That and Purell oh. now, it's convenient. Exactly. For anyone out there who's not moisturizing their hands, just take the plunge. Or if there's any moisturizing companies that want to sponsor the podcast, we're all for it. So oh, yeah. that would be even better. Yeah. That would be phenomenal. Roll. Awesome. Well, Lepore, getting into the week that was for the Toronto Maple Leafs. So like I said, they went three and one. And now I'm going to give a brief description of what happened. So okay. the Leafs started off the week on Monday with a pretty dominant performance against the Winnipeg Jets. They beat Winnipeg 3-1, to one, outshot them 22-6 to six in the second period. If it wasn't for Connor Hellebuck, that game could have been 4 or 5-1. It was yeah. a really good performance. Awesome. Then on Wednesday against the Edmonton Oilers, that game was a shit show. It was yep. the most boring game of the year. According to James Myrtle, okay, the Leafs had a .75 expected goals at 5-on-5, five five, tied for their second-worst output in a game over the last three seasons. So What? <laughs> so, so that right there totally tells you what happened in that game, and the eye test um, actually confirmed that because that game was boring as hell. There was barely any scoring chances back and forth. There was the own goal from Muzzin. Thornton left the game with a rib fracture. He's out four weeks. But then the Leafs on Friday night playing the Oilers again were able to bounce back without Austin Matthews in the lineup who yeah. had a minor hand injury. So that was a really good yeah. win. Anderson played well. It was a good win for the Leafs without Thornton and Matthews. And then, of course, on Sunday night, the Leafs closed out the week with a 3-2 win over the Calgary Flames. Jack Campbell was in net. He played really well, made 31 saves. So, of course, the Leafs with a pretty solid week, Lepore, after we... I don't want to say we totally shit on them last week. We, we yeah. were a little bit tougher than most people probably were on this team. But uh, what are your thoughts on on how they played this week, starting with that Jets game? All in all, happy. I mean, with the results, you got to be happy. Um, but I will say, like, starting with the Jets game, I think something we really focused on last week was them being dialed in. And not even about the results of the game but just watching the game and getting the eye test and feeling like this team was really ready to play. And that was the game. That's the type of game I should say that I think Leafs fan circle. And that's what we want to see. And when I say that, I'm not even referring to necessarily the Leafs getting the win or blowing out their opponent, but they look good, man. They look good. Like you touched on that second period. I think there was one power play where they got 10 shots where Hellebuck was just bouncing around, saving everything. It was like a shooting gallery. And then that was the one where they finally did score, if I'm uh, remembering correctly. But like yeah, they, just look, right they, they, just, they, they just look good, man. 
in that game. Very, very impressive. Very impressive. And again, that's the team everyone wants to set what everyone wants to see. And it's easy for us to say, yeah, we want the Leafs to dominate the puck, dominate the shot count, uh, make their goalie work. But with the talent on this roster that we've been touching on since we started this podcast, I think it's something we're allowed to expect from this roster. Like, what do you think about that first Jets game? Yeah. So I like the way they played and I thought they dominated possession. And it's like I said, you know, if it wasn't for Connor Hellebuck, the Leafs probably would have won that game four or five. He's amazing. One. Hellebuck he's really so is amazing. Good. And yeah, he's and, crazy. And, and I think when it, you know, with the Jets, I, I still don't like their defense core. And I've said okay. this in a previous podcast, their top six is incredible. And we'll get to who they've brought in now. Mm-hmm. Big trade that went down a few days ago. But there was a trade? There may, there may have been a little trade. Yeah. There may have been a little may trade. may have been one, yeah. But, uh, yeah, no, I mean, Connor Hellebuck's incredible. Reigning Vesna Trophy winner. I mean, that dude just stands on his head every game. He's, he's really, really good. One thing I will say about the Leafs, though, when it comes to that game, they played so well, and I thought they were so dominant. But, again, it was one of those games that came down right to the end. Yeah. Where they were kind of hanging on in the third period, even though they controlled most of the game. You know, the Jets pull Hellebuck. You know, they have the extra attacker and the Leafs close it out with an empty net goal. But again, that's a game where I'd like to see the Leafs just step on their throat. Right. And we and, haven't really and, seen that yet, I guess. Like exactly. thinking about all the results quickly in my head. Yeah. Even though they have been impressive for the, you know, for the most part in these first seven games, we still haven't seen that big signature win where they just absolutely dominate an opponent, not only when, you know, when it comes to shots and advanced metrics, but on the scoreboard too, right? Right. So, so that's, you know, that's how I thought about that game. Overall, it was good. I was happy with it, but Laporte getting, getting now to, to that big trade yeah. that we alluded to. If you, yeah. unless you've been living under a rock, you know that the Winnipeg Jets traded Patrick Laine and Jack Roslevic to the Columbus Blue Jackets for Pierre-Luc Dubois and a third round pick. So Laporte, what are your initial thoughts on this trade? It's a big one, man. It's funny how like quickly things change. Like we think back only a few years ago, he's a young player on how much Liney meant to the Winnipeg Jets. And as Leafs fans, we all remember that Matthews Liney rookie year where the Leafs blew that lead in Winnipeg and Liney scored a hat trick. And you think like as a Jets fan, they, as the Jets fans must've been thinking like, wow, we got this guy, the whole finish thing, Timu Solani, blah, 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 blah. And now a few years later, he's gone. And I don't know if that's a reflection of Patrick Liney. I don't know if that's a reflection of the Winnipeg Jets. Or I don't know if that's a reflection of today's National Hockey League player in the way that we can't have these types of emotional connections like we used to because we're not going to see guys spend their entire careers with one organization, especially the big stars. Then you throw in the cap. But I don't know. Like, do, Do you think Jets fans... If you're a Jets fan today, is there a part of you? I mean, they got a good player back, but is there a part of you that, you, that thinks that there should have been an emotional connection to Liney and sad that he's gone? Or are you just okay seeing him go? I see why a lot of Jets fans are upset. And it's like you said, it's it's that emotional connection, right? He goes second overall. He comes yeah. in as you know one of the most hyped prospects that team has essentially ever had, right? You yeah. know, he comes in first season, lights it up. First two seasons, he had one 40 goal season, and I believe like a 35 or 34 goal season. And he got so hurt. That, like, and he got hurt that first year too. He exactly. missed games. Yeah. And looks like this dude is just going to score 40 goals a year in his sleep. So I could see why Jets fans are upset. You know, it because you know his play, his play tapered off a little bit. Like he's been good. But he hasn't been that dominant, you know, 40 goal scorer year in and year out. So, yeah, you know, I would be a little bit upset as a Jets fan because I thought he was going to have, you know, a long career in Winnipeg. And I thought he was going to be one of the best goal scorers in the league for a long time. But saying all that, I really like this trade for the Jets, Lepore. Yeah, I like it a lot. And it all comes to who they have down the middle now. Because you pair up Mark Shifley with Pierre-Luc Dubois. I mean, they're immediately now one of the best center duos in the NHL. I don't want to say, you know, they're a top five center duo, but I think they're somewhere in that, you know, five to eight range. And if you have two studs like that down the middle, like to upgrade from Paul Stastny as your number two center to Pierre-Luc Dubois, when you already have 
really good top six wingers in Blake Wheeler, Kyle Connor, who's been incredible this season. Incredible player. Nikolai Ehlers. So I think when you just look at the way that the Jets are constructed, and I've said this, you know, many times about this team, I still think their defense core needs a lot of work. But when you look at that forward group and the way it's constructed now, I'm really liking how that looks moving forward. Yeah, I think I think where I have them with Dubois now is that on any given night, they they kind of were like this before, but you'll know what I mean by this. They're good enough to beat anybody. Like like you said, when you've Shifley and PLD, you are good enough to beat anyone. And you mentioned you mentioned Connor. Like he kind of had the reputation last year of being maybe the most underrated player in the league. He's not underrated anymore. Like people are fully aware. Man, this guy, this guy is scoring for fun right now. Like the you commonly hear the threat of like, you know, someone's always dangerous. Like it seems like he's always dangerous. And man, like, like very, very, very good player. But in terms of the Jets now, again, so you think you think we we agree they got better, getting stronger down the middle. But do you see their playoff potential any better? Or do you see like higher expectations, fair playoff expectations for the organization now? Like coming into the season. I thought that the Jets would be a borderline playoff team in the in the North Division. And and I still, for the most part, even though they're off to a pretty solid start this year, I still think they're kind of a borderline team. And again, okay. I think it just comes down to their their defense core and their team defense in general. And I know Hellebuck's incredible, but I, I really think that's the weakness of their team. And and listen, I, I think they're kind of in the same boat as Edmonton and Vancouver. Right now, it looks like the Leafs and the Habs are the two best teams in the division. And I know it's only been seven games. And I think everyone else is going to be just sort of jockeying for position over the next yeah. little while. There's going to be so, a bag of everything else. So I, I don't really think it. And you know what? I, it's like I said, I, I think it makes them a better team. And yeah, maybe that does give them a better chance to make a playoff run, especially having those two centers. I mean, again, just look at any team that's won the cup over the last decade. And, you know, the two centermen that they've had on, on their rosters, whether you look at, you know, Washington with Backstrom and Kuznetsov, Crosby and Malkin, right? right? I mean, even, I mean, I know the Bruins, you know, haven't won a cup, but they've been a very successful team over the last, you know, eight to 10 years. Well, what, they won a cup, I believe it was like, what, 2011? But Bergeron right. and Krejci, right? So, sure. yeah. so you need, you need 2011, 2011 Krejci. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So you, you need two dudes down the middle. So I, I do think it makes them a better team. And then when I look at Columbus, like I know there's this narrative going around that Line A and Tortorella aren't going to get along. Yeah. <laughs> and it's it's going to be difficult for him. And I can see that. And I think it might be a little bit of a tough transition for him just, just based on the way he plays. He's more of like a perimeter player. He doesn't really fit the, the mold of, of, you know, someone you think would thrive under Tortorella. But listen, yeah, we man. saw Panarin light it up with Tortorella. Yeah. Line A is a great goal scorer. He's going to produce. They're yeah. going to be fine. That system that he runs in Columbus, they, they always figure it out. Depend, it doesn't matter who's in the lineup. So I, I think they're going to be fine. But yeah, I, I love this move for the Jets. Yeah. I remember, I forget what journalist it was. And again, like, like I'm not here to judge any player's personality because we're all just guessing. So we don't know. We don't know them. But I forget which journalist it was in Toronto where it was Liney's first game against the Leafs in Toronto. And of course, like he gets attacked after practice. The journalists are are all over him asking him questions. And it was pretty well known that he was visibly rattled. And the reaction was, thank God the Leafs didn't didn't end up with number two. Because they get like, he wouldn't have been able to handle it. Like the guy pointed out, it would have been a complete and utter disaster had this guy ended up at number two. And again, like that's fair. Like some guys just don't like the limelight they don't like to be asked a million questions they don't want to be that guy and if you want to be away from that spectacle and just score your 40 goals in a lot of markets that's okay but in toronto i don't think he would have been able to avoid that so i think we should count our blessings and be thankful that we dodged a bullet with that one it could have it could have got ugly in a hurry from what i've seen journalists report online oh man the night the leafs won that draft lottery in 2016 <laughs> oh my that was one of the greatest nights in franchise history i will yeah, never hopefully forget. we can look back at that and like add it to a chapter to the book of something one day but yeah no that oh, was yeah awesome. absolutely yeah. well yeah. lapore sticking with this this trade i know yeah. you have some some strong thoughts on pierre luc dubois because there was a lot of teams obviously in the running for him 
we all knew that he was disgruntled. We all knew that he wanted out of Columbus. Things had obviously gone sour there. Um, there's a specific Canadian team that you think should have taken a harder run at Pierre-Luc Dubois. So give me your thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, you, you never know how much these teams are really involved and how much action is actually happening behind the scenes. Uh, like with PLD, a lot of people, what a lot of people are unaware of is his dad is the assistant coach of the Manitoba Moose. So because of that connection, like maybe that deal in Winnipeg was just going to happen no matter what. But there was so much att attention with the Montreal Canadiens. Now, if it's because they're a team who needs center depth, whether it's because uh, they're in the Canadian market, so people want to talk about it, or whether because the guy's name is Pierre-Luc Dubois, and that would just make perfect sense for him to play for Les Habitants de Montréal. Um, but I just, I really hope Montreal went for it. I really do. Cause I really think like we talk about Montreal now and like, they look good. Like they look very, very good. They're well balanced, but I just think adding that dimension to their lineup would have put them in that next tier of teams. Like right now, Montreal is dangerous. They would have been very dangerous. And it kind of would have been a message within the division of like the Montreal Canadians aren't fucking around if they would have made a deal like that. But, and I'm not here to shit on Bergevin because like, I think he's done a great job. Like you look at the deals he's done and you go all the way back to even the Subban Weber deal. And he, he had balls like Bergevin showed a lot of balls to make that deal. And he got shit on a lot because Subban was younger. He was a fan favorite. I remember stepping back. It was kind of funny. I don't know if you remember everyone was shitting on that deal, almost not even acknowledging like who Shea Weber was. Like the guy was like on the Olympic team as a defenseman, maybe the best defenseman on that team. And people just kind of like, oh, we lost Subban. And it was like, no, you, you picked up a great player. Like, like, like I, I like that deal even at the time. And even now it's proven like a plus deal all the way to get Shea Weber. But then you look to look to other deals he's made recently. A plus again, to get Tatar and Suzuki for Pacioretty. Like that, that's an incredible deal. Like Dino from Chicago, like incredible deal. Like Bergevin has quietly done very, very well. But I wonder, like two deals that I would circle to circle that maybe haven't been the best are the deal to get Jonathan Drouin away from Tampa Bay. Yeah, and the Sergeyev deal. Yeah, the Sergeyev deal. You can circle that one and you can circle signing Jake Allen. Now, some people I've heard argue for the Jake Allen deal in the way that they were bringing even more punch to a strength they have in Carey Price. But... Contrary to the belief of a lot of hockey fans and people in Canada, the Toronto Maple Leafs are not the only hockey team that is against the cap or near the cap. The Canadians, I think last time I checked, they were in around like 700, 800 grand below the cap. And you look at those two deals and you see Jonathan Druin making five and a half million. And then you see Jake Allen, who I think it's something like 4.25 or 4.35. Yeah, so him and Price are essentially making fifteen million dollars. Dude, you, you you have twenty million on Price, Druin, and a backup goalie. So I mean, you spend your money again. We talk about balance and how teams decide to do, and you can debate that stuff all day long. But I'd love to ask Montreal Canadiens fans right now if you like those deals at the time and what you think of them now. Because if you had a backup goalie at the typical million, and maybe you could have made something happen with Druin a lot easier, or the deal with Drew and then I think a lot of people know what it, it didn't go well for Montreal. Like if you hated that deal, now do you really hate that deal? Because maybe it prevented you from making this deal for Pierre-Luc Dubois, because if you had that cap space or if you had that money better allocated, you could have more easily made a deal. So like, I'd love to have that conversation with Habs fans. Like I said, I'm not here to shit on Bergevin. Like I think he's done a great job. I just think the opportunity to make that move to put Montre Montreal on that next level got hindered. I think because of those those two signings, those two guys. I guess we'll no, see. We'll, you make yeah. a really good point because I think that that sort of deal would have absolutely put Montreal over the top. I would have been afraid, man. And I would, would have, have showed afraid, the yeah. entire Canadian division, hey, we're only seven games into the season, but we're going for this fucking thing. Yeah. And, and that's exactly what they need, right? Because you look at their roster and yes, I like their balance. I like how they're getting contributions from the decor. Jeff Petrie's been great to start the season. Shea Weber's been solid. Romanov's playing well. You know, when you look at all four of their lines, 
you know, I don't want to say their bottom six is like, you know, incredibly potent, but they're getting contributions from their it's bottom nice, six. Is it, right? I meant to mention the Anderson signing too. Again, we talked about how it might not look good in five years, but yeah. right now it makes them better and it was a nice signing. Absolutely. So when you look at their depth, it's impressive. But at the end of the day, when you look at their top end talent, I still think that's where this team falls short. And, you know, it remains to be seen how far a team constructed like this can get you know, into the playoffs. And, and I kind of look at the, the New York Islanders okay. and just the style that they play with Barry Trotz, great defensive system, a well-balanced team, a solid underrated defense core. And you look at a team like that and you say, okay, what's their ceiling? They can yeah. win a round, they can win two rounds, but can a team that's built like that without, and listen, I know the Islanders have Matt Barzell, who's a really good player, but yeah. can a team that's built like that win the Stanley cup. Right. And I think the answer is no, based on, you know, just looking at the last decade, let's say yeah. we could even the go be, the best, the best teams have the best players at, at the end of the day. So. And, and that's where I still think the haves are, are lacking a little bit is that they don't have that top end game breaking talent. And again, we've talked about Nick Suzuki and how good we both think he is and, and how great he's going to be moving forward. But if you could have Pierre Luke Dubois and Nick Suzuki, and then you have Philip Deneau because, you know, it's hilarious looking at Phil Deneau because Habs fans, you know, they'll say it all the time. He's one of the best defensive centers in the league. That's great, but that guy shouldn't be your number one center. If, yeah. if Philip Deneau is slotted in as your number one center, which was essentially the case last season, I mean, look what, look what happens to your team, right? And I know Suzuki's taken another step this year, but if yeah, they could have so found good. a way to bring in Pierre-Luc Dubois with all the depth that they do have and some of the young assets they have, even if you had shipped, you know, Kotkaniemi, you add in a first round pick. They were talking about Kotkaniemi. I'm like, they want more than that. It would have been like Kotkaniemi plus, plus, plus. Oh like yeah, they, they would have had to, it wouldn't have been like a line A Roslovic situation. The Habs yeah. would have had to include, you know, two to three players, a couple of draft picks, but I, I think they had the ammo to make it work. And, you know, We'll, we'll see what happens moving forward with this Habs team. We'll see if, if their depth can shine through come playoff time. But uh, that remains to be seen. As it says right now, like if you had to bet, do you th would you say they make a deal, like a significant deal before the playoffs, before the deadline? Do you expect them to? I, I don't really expect any team to make a significant deal in a season like j this, just with the... Really? And listen, I'm not saying there's not going to be any trades whatsoever. And I know we just saw a pretty big trade with Line A and Dubois. But within, you know, when you factor in the whole, you know, guys got a quarantine and things like that, I don't know. Right. To me, and, and the, with the cap situation, it's a condensed season. You know, things are moving really quickly here. Yeah. I there's don't, actual financials involved, like, like actual I, dollars and cents involved. Exactly. I, I don't think there's going to be like a groundbreaking deal. Yeah. Um. I, I don't know. That's just the way that I look at it. I, I could totally be proven wrong. It's like I said, look at the deal that just went down, right? With these two star players. So, you know, that remains to be seen, but no, I, I don't really see anything crazy um, shaking the landscape of the national hockey league. Uh, something, something that, ca that came up and this definitely would have, would have shaked the land, uh, shook in the landscape of the national hockey league. And I don't know if it was just buzz cause I'm here in Ottawa, but it was maybe uh, a deal with Ottawa for Dubois for Kachuk. Now, like I saw that, I saw the, yeah, like I saw that and it raised my eyebrows. Like, would you have made that deal if you're Ottawa? Cause like, I think Columbus makes that deal. That's really, really intriguing because if yeah. you listen to our last podcast, we pumped the tires of Brady Kachuk. Yeah. I mean, that dude, he's, he's just a great all around player. It looks like he's going to be a cornerstone of that franchise moving forward. But again, Lepore, what I look at, and now they're very similar in age. I think Dubois is what a year or two older than Kachuk. Yeah, he just signed his RFA deal. Yeah. And and I and I look at just having that stud center, Pierre Luc Dubois, 22 years old. And listen, I, I know that people will look at his stats in Columbus and be like, well, he hasn't really had a breakout season. He's not a point per game player. But when you think about the style that the Jackets play under John Tortorella, unless you're an Artemi Panarin type player, you're probably not going to be a point per game player in that system. So I think when you see Dubois in Winnipeg, you know, playing with, you know, whether he gets the chance to play with Wheeler, Connor, Ehlers, whoever, right. I, I think he's going to take that offensive game to the next level. And man, if, if I'm Ottawa, I, I think that, I think that probably makes them a better team. 
Really? I really, really do. Just, just for the fact, just for the fact that he's a centerman, 22 years old. I mean, I, I, I think I take that guy all day over the winger. That's just yeah. how I approach it. What, what may have scared, I mean, not just Ottawa teams altogether is that he's only signed for two years. That, that may have, if they're, if they're expecting to sign Kachuk like a full seven or seven or eight years, that may have scared them that he's only signed for two years. And then you run into that old situation again, but again, who knows, but fun, man, fun stuff to talk about, fun stuff to talk about. Yeah. That's, there's always, there's always fun trade scenarios to break down, especially yeah. when something like this happens. You always look at the teams that could have done something, should have done something, but we'll see how it pans out. But Laporte, moving on now to the next opponent the Leafs took on in week. Do we have two to? Do we season. have to talk about this game? <laughs> <laughs> we got to do it. We got to oh do it. Oh my god! As brutal as it was. Oh my god! Leafs Edmonton that first game it was billed as McDavid versus Matthews. It was going to yeah. be the highest scoring game of the entire season, seven six. It was going to go to overtime where Matthews sniped one top shelf to win the game, and Laporte, like I said off the top of the show. It was the most boring game of the year. Oh my God, I'm shaking my head. It's so funny because I can't help but think sometimes about what the NHL is as a brand, especially in the United States. And here you have this game, two high two high flying teams, two of the best players in the sport early in the season. They're pumping it all day long and you get the worst game I've probably ever seen. Just bad all the way around. Neither team could cycle the puck or keep possession. There was turnovers all over the place. It was like they were sk- skating in mud. The first goal was a joke. Like that, like you said, Vessi knocking it off Muzzin. And then Matthew's tying goal was terrible. Then you had the ghost penalty on Muzzin where the, the, the Oilers player was tripped by his own guy. And of course they score on it. Like it, it was just like a bad, bad game all around. Like so disappointing. And that that's just where like the NHL just got to put their hands up in the air and be like, guys, come on. Like we're, we're, tr- we're trying to market this thing. Like we're, we're going through a pandemic. We need cash. And when this is our spotlight game to start the season and this is what we get, like just absolutely terrible. Just gross, 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 gross. That, that was a game that neither team deserved to win. No, yeah. Like no. It, it was just brutal. And and you know what? Saying that, I actually think the Leafs slightly outplayed Edmonton in that game, even though both teams generated nothing offensively. Yeah, it was just I one of those weird games, dude. right? It's like weird bounces, the own goal, the phantom, you know, tripping call on Jake Muzzin. And it was just one of those bizarre games where you look up at the scoreboard at the end of the game and you're like, How did Edmonton win this game? How did how did any of these teams win this game? This is brutal. Yeah. Yeah, I know there's no fans in the building, but that's one of those games where uh, imagine being that guy who played $800 for uh, platinum seats in Toronto to sit sit against the glass. Oh, my God. Give my money back. But Laporte, what do you think of the Edmonton Oilers early on in the season? Because they, I guess we could say they haven't lived up to expectations or maybe they're the team we thought they were going to be, right? With their lack of depth. Uh, they only rely on McDavid and Dreisaitl, it seems, to generate all their offense. But um, what did you notice from the Oilers taking on the Leafs in week two? The Oilers are really funny to me. Like, I, I don't know about you, but if I look at all the teams in the Canadian division, the Oilers are the team that I think most that if they if someone told me the Oilers were going to win the division, I wouldn't have been absolutely shocked just because of McDavid and Dreisaitl. But then at the same time, if you told me they were going to be an absolute disaster, I wouldn't be surprised either. And looking how the season's going so far and watching a lot of their games, it seems like it's going to be the latter, man. Like they, they do not look good. You mentioned how much they rely on McDavid and Dreisaitl. Like it is obvious how much they rely on those two guys. And you look at their lineup, man. It's like, it's almost hard to do like how bad that that lineup is and like things that just are completely perplexing. Like you have the best hockey player on the planet playing with Cassian. Like how, how it's unacceptable. It's it's like, what, like how, how is this even a thing? And then even they they tell you like, he plays with Nugent Hopkins on his other wing and hear all these things. Oh, how much Nugent Hopkins loves it in Edmonton and this and that. Yeah. Well, no fucking shit. He's playing with Connor McDavid. Like who else is he going to play with anywhere else? Give me a break. And like, now I'm going to be the Leaf fan who pisses Oilers fans off all that talk about McDavid and Matthews training together in the summer. Imagine how it feels to be on the ice with Matthews shooting the shit he sees this guy who he knows he's better than 
And he know, like deep down, McDavid knows he's the face of the league. He's the best player in the league. And he looks across the ice and he's like, that guy who's playing in my city gets to play with Marner, Tavares, and Nylander. I, I can't even get one of those guys like on my wing. My other star player play, plays in another line. It's just bad, man. Like the, the Oilers, I don't know. Like the, the, I look at that team and I'd like for someone to point something out to me that they do in the lineup that really truly helps McDavid. Well, I, I can't even think of something like they, they, they try to patch things up getting like Barry and tourists. And I'm just like, man, like it's, it's bad in Edmonton bad. And you know what, man, I'm going to say it of all these things that we can point to with the Oilers and as bad as they are, I think that the thing that might drive me most nuts is where the fuck does Miko Koskinen get off wearing number 19? <laughs> like, has someone not told him that a goalie should be one or 30? Or yeah, that, that doesn't make any sense. Holy fuck. Like, how is that even allowed? Because, first of all, if you were good, you could yeah, get away yeah. with that. Oh, my God. But when you're out here allowing, you know, four to five goals a night and your team is just getting shellacked, even though McDavid and Dreisaitl are seemingly going off every single night, you yeah, have some that's issues. That's just it. That's just it. Like, I'm watching I'm watching McDavid. And, like, we talked, I mentioned before with certain players, how, like, okay, they're a threat every time they're on the ice. No, Connor McDavid is a threat every time he is on the ice. It's like that little jump he gets and you sit up. Not even like, ooh, it's a half chance. No, like I feel like he's going to score every time he gets the puck. And to know that you have that player and then you have a, an, another player who's a Hart Trophy winner and you're still bad, that's hard to do. Lapore, I, I think it's flat out embarrassing the way that this team has not been able to take the next step despite having... It's crazy who I think are two of the top five players in the National Hockey League. No question. Now, listen, we all we all think McDavid's the best player in the league. I don't think you can dispute that. You know, there are some people who, th- who think that Dreisaitl defensively lacks a little bit. But listen, Dreisaitl is one of the top five offensive players in the game. Okay, yeah. these two are dominant night in and night out. And for this team to not get past the second round of the playoffs in the McDavid era yeah. is a complete embarrassment. Well, we thought that year, that year, we it was kind of the whole feeling of like the Oilers have arrived. Like we thought like this is going to be the next 10 years. Yeah, you thought they were just going to keep getting better and better and better. And their inability to surround those two guys with players that they should be playing with, with players that they can, you know, create offensively and and dominate games with, it's just not happening. Mm -hmm. And I just look at, at some of the players on that roster and it's like you said, right, with Zach Cassian. You know, we even talked about Joe Thornton, how he should be demoted from the Marner and Matthews line, and Leaf fans are, you know, complaining about Joe Thornton, who should be on the first line, who should be playing with Tavares and Nylander. And then the Oilers are putting Zach Cassian out with the best player in the world. Yeah, what was McDavid thinking? What was McDavid thinking when he feathered that pass to him that would have iced the game and Cassian hit the crossbar? Oh, like, 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 I, where am I? Like, he's got to just have his hands up in the air. Like, where am I? Just, I, I can't even imagine what he's going through. And, th- and then I look at, I look at the defense core as well. And I know Oscar Clefbaum's out for the year, and he's a really good player. I like uh, Oscar. Yeah, Clefbaum. I like, I like Clefbaum. Yeah. Now, now, I don't think he's like a legit number one defenseman, but I think he's a really good, you know, twenty minute per night defenseman. He can run the top power play unit, moves the puck well. But then you go down, and and I like Darnell Nurse. And Adam Larson, you know, he, he's out there. He does his job. He blocks shots. He hits guys. You know, he's, for the most part, he's solid. He's not contributing anything offensively. Mm-hmm. Tyson Berry so far, you know, hasn't really done much. There's a lot, you know, a lot, of, laughs, kinda, lot of laughs on Twitter of those uh, slap shots going high and wide uh, for Leafs fans saying, yeah, I remember that. <laughs> a, lot, a lot of what we saw mm-hmm. last season. And I'm just looking at that roster. And then, like you said, with Koskinen and that goaltending and bringing back Mike Smith. And it's like... How are you not able to assemble a better team with two of the top five players in the world? How can you not convince like convince people to like people talk about Edmonton and people not wanting to play in Edmonton? You, if you're a winger, you're gonna play with Dry Seidel or McDavid. That's pretty enticing, man. And like maybe I don't know enough about those logistics, but from what I do know, that's pretty enticing if you're a player. Even if it was a short-term deal. Like even if you were a guy like Taylor Hall. 
who wanted to go there short term and play with one of those guys, light it up for the year and then move on to a bigger contract. They couldn't, they, they can't convince quote unquote that guy to do that. I mean, it's, it's, it's very perplexing. It's bad, man. Edmonton, Edmonton's in a lot of trouble. And like, I mean, I, I grew up loving Gretzky's so They're kind of the Oilers are kind of like in my heart, like they are in trouble. And I'm interested to see where it's going to go, like in the short term and like the medium, the medium term as well. Like things are going to happen. Like I really see things happening there and moves and maybe something dramatic, man. But like even looking at that game, like and like how bad that game was, I was listening to uh, Spin Chicklets and they had Eichel on and he raised my eyebrows a little bit and some of the stuff he was talking about. And pointing out that like there was no, you forget that there was a very short training camp. Some players hadn't played since March like weird circumstances, even guys had a hard time training in the off season because of lack of facilities, this and that. And he kind of made me think about how bad that game was against the Oilers. And you've seen a lot of weird things happening, like crazy high scoring games, teams getting blown out, duds like that one. If I remember correctly, the Bruins went three games without an even strength goal. Like, like how, how yeah. does that happen? Like we're seeing really weird things. Do you think what Eichel was talking about is playing into this kind of weirdness and ugly games both ways that we're seeing early in the year like high scoring games very low scoring boring game boring games and bad play like you think he that like can you point to that you think it's fair to point to all that oh yeah i i think that's definitely a factor because when you look at the lack of training camp no preseason games you know players aren't as sharp as they normally would be and if you look at just a you know a regular off season and training camp and preseason, you know, guys still come into the year and there's high scoring games, yeah. right? So now add on to the fact that we're dealing with COVID and, you know, obviously everything was just sort of happened so quick and we just jumped into the season. I'm not surprised one bit that we've seen some ugly games so far. Yeah. And Even then no, pre- talk- no preseason, like, like actually think about that for a second. No zero preseason. Yeah, because you don't get a chance at all to, you know, figure out line combinations. And yeah, you could have your interest squad games and, and you know, play around with things like that. But at the end of the day, you know, even going back to the Leafs with like Thornton, Matthews, and Marner, it would have been nice if they had, you know, three or four preseason games to work out oh, the kinks yeah. and, and see if that worked. Or, you know, maybe they could have tried someone else on that line. And then, you know, saying all that, you look at a team like Edmonton, who isn't good defensively, whose goaltending is shaky, And you add in, you know, no preseason, short training camp. That's a recipe for disaster. Yeah. And so far, we've seen that with Edmonton. We've seen that with the Vancouver Canucks. I believe they're dead last in the league in in goals against. Yeah, Pedersen's had a terrible start. Yeah, Pedersen has two points in the first seven games. Terrible. Oh, my God. It's a disaster for that team as well. But, but yeah, I mean, when you look at the Edmonton Oilers, and and I even go back to to their playoff series against uh, Chicago in the qualifying round. So Chicago is one of, you know, another team that got lucky to make the playoffs last year with the format, you know, during COVID they, they got invited as like, I think they were like the 23rd ranked team out of the 24 that came back. I like how and, you say that they got invited <laughs> <laughs> the NHL, man, they got they invited. Just said, Come the on playoff. down Chicago. Yeah. Why the Ooh. hell not? We yeah. already have, uh, you know, two thirds of the league here, get your asses down here, but no, it was, and then, and then, you know, McDavid and dry lit it up in the qualifying round. I think McDavid had like nine points in four games and the yeah, Oilers lose in four games to the friggin' Blackhawks. Like, yeah. are you kidding me? You couldn't beat that Blackhawks team in a five game series. So yeah, I, I just look at all the problems they have. And Lapore, you, you talked about something dramatic happening with this team. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm going to say it right now. Connor McDavid, okay, has five years left on his contract after this season. Okay. At some point, do we oh, see him? Force where, where are you going? Where are you going, Bruno? <laughs> of Edmonton. I just said it. And you could say the same thing about Jack Eichel, who's in the exact same situation in Buffalo. Who his name we brought up, yeah. He has exactly. You talked about Jack Eichel. He's got this year and five more years left on his monster contract. Right. Are these guys regretting signing these big contracts? I don't think, I mean, specifically to the deals, like, I don't think, I don't think they regret signing their deals, but it's kind of funny. Like th- those deals are such huge contracts. 
but no one would question them right now. Like even McDavid, I think value-wise, his 12 and a half million is one of the best deal values in the league, like with whatever metrics they use. And, and even Eichel at 10 million, like a, any team would take that for a legit number one center who's that young and that prolific. But I think the question is like, do they want, do they want to be where they are? And I'll, well, I'll fire this back at you. If you had to put, if you had that million dollar bet of who will demand a trade out of where they are, who's making that trade request first? Oh man. And I know there's been, well, first things are, no, I'll step back. I'll step back a second. Do you see either of those players finishing those deals where they are? I'll say there's a good chance that one of them will not finish out their contracts where they so you're saying right at least now. one. Okay. And then who are you thinking? So, so who, who would you say has a better chance to finish their deal and who would be the one to ask for the trade? Okay. That's, that's a <laughs> tough question, but, and listen, he doesn't strike me as the person who would want to force his way out of a situation. There's yeah. been no rumblings that he wants to leave. He's the best player on the planet. Yeah. But I really think that this could get to a breaking point with Connor McDavid and the Edmonton Oilers because, again, you're Connor McDavid, and it's like you said, right? You're training with Austin Matthews in the offseason, and you're looking at Matthews being in almost a perfect situation as a top centerman, right? With the in talent. your in your city, in your in city. your city. And, and I'm not sitting here saying McDavid's going to come to the Leafs. The Leafs have no salary cap space. Like, I mean, that's, that's just not going to happen. But yeah. you're looking at that situation. You're saying, you know, I have Leon Dreisaitl here. He just won the MVP. And we're two of the best players on the planet. And we, we can't even win a playoff series. Like, we, we can't even get past the second round of the playoffs. I don't even so think it's that, that Bruno. The, like, the Leafs haven't even gone that far. I just think it's a matter of, like, potential. Like, see, like what's Edmonton's ceiling right now? I think that's the way you can look at it. Like, fair they been, enough. Have, yeah. Have they, like, I mean, again, like, the Leafs haven't had playoff success. But if we said, like, no one would be shocked if the Leafs made a run. If I think people would be pretty shocked, even if I said before, like, it wouldn't shock me if the Oilers finish near the top of the division, I'd still be shocked if they made a, a, a legit run yeah. and we could pick them as a team to maybe like lift the cup. Yeah. I think it's more, like you said, sort of looking at the trajectory of that team and being yeah, like, okay, right what, what yeah. path are they on right now uh, in terms of how they're assembled? Who do they have coming in? And it's like, even when you look at, you know, some of the Oilers draft picks, I know they drafted a couple of defensemen in the first round, two out of the last three years, I believe, but those guys don't seem like they're anything special either. I think, um, Evan Bouchard and I forgot the other guy's name, but I mean, there's really no one coming up, you know, in the system who you're excited about, you know, and they're still going to be, you know, a a fairly decent team just because they have McDavid and Dreisaitl. So they're never going to be in a situation again where, you know, they're picking in the top five of the draft. So if you're Connor McDavid, you're sitting there and you're going, holy shit, I'm locked in here for, you know, the next six seasons with this team. And again, he doesn't strike me as someone who would force his way out. And I know there's been rumblings with Jack Eichel, you know, over the last year or so that he hasn't been happy in Buffalo. Well, well, Eichel's different the way that he gets on the mic and he demands change, <laughs> change to, to his organization and his team. And which, I mean, I can appreciate the guy wants to win. No one can question that. So I appreciate when he does make those comments. But what do you think? Like if you had to pick one of those guys... I don't know. Like, I don't. I, I don't know why, but I see McDavid going first. I would see Mc, and I, I, I don't know. Like, I, I can see Buffalo, n- not even as if like I go. Oh, I can see them figuring it out and becoming some juggernaut. But just for some reason, I point to the McDavid situation, and I just see like I, I see this kid getting tired of this. And even if he's not that personality, you get one career. You, you get one career, and I think sometimes as fans we forget about that. Like you'll hear about a certain player that wants out of a situation, whether he doesn't get along with a coach or he doesn't like an environment or the situation that team's in. And that player gets shit on quite often by fans and media. Oh, like selfish player, this and that. You get one career. And we have a, like the, McDavid might be the best player we've ever seen. Like this guy's may be the best, the best player that, we see in our lifetime going, going forward, there might not be another Connor McDavid after this. So it, it will get to a point where like, we don't want to see a wasted career. And when I say wasted, I mean, in the way of 
like playoff success and like man like if, if this guy's not like well I'll put it this way like he'd be the right now he'd be the best player ever to not win the championship like people 100%, 100% always make, agree. yeah people always make that list like Marcel Dion and these guys that, that n- never lifted a cup but like right now it's no question and like they're not even close so and, and that's the thing right it's like we're not saying that they need to go out and win you know two or three cups in a row yeah but, but you got to be a competitive team year in and year out when yeah. the year starts, I need to know that with the team that they have assembled there in Edmonton with McDavid and Dreisaitl, that that team is among, you know, the top three to five teams to win the Stanley Cup. And right now they're just not. You know, what I just thought of actually like, in, like similar, similarly, do you think of Pittsburgh and Washington where like if we, if we thought of the two most gener- generational talents, like previously Crosby and Ovechkin, both teams were very good fairly quickly. Like they, they got talent around them. They figured it out. And, and again, like even, when, when you have that no, no, cheat code, ahead. yeah, when you have that cheat code, that's Crosby or Ovechkin or uh, McDavid or Dreisaitl, it shouldn't be that hard to figure it out. And again, it, 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 there's no there's no secret pathway to get like deep in the playoffs. But like you use the word of like, like their trajectory, it's not good. It, it doesn't look good and it's perplexing and it's concerning. And how can it not get to a point for an athlete? Cause we judge these guys based on kind of like on their demeanor, like McDavid's kind of a quiet guy. He might be shy, whatever. doesn't mean he's not pissed off at the world just cause he's a quiet guy and saying, fuck this. I want out of here. So it's it, that that's something I, I'm really, in, really, really interested to see like how it, how it unfolds like as the, the years go on. Yeah. Cause even if you look at a team like, like Washington, right. And you could say, Oh, Washington only won one cup in the Ovechkin era. But Washington was winning the President's Trophy. Oh, yeah. They've they been were the top, you know, five regular season teams for like a 10 year stretch, right? Yeah. With Ovechkin. No, no, and one, no, nobody was saying Ovechkin's got to get out of there. Like, like, no one gave that narrative. Exactly. So, yeah, I mean, moving forward, it, it doesn't look good in Edmonton. And again, like, I wouldn't be surprised, Lapore, if they make the playoffs this year just because they have McDavid and Dreisaitl and those two guys just say, get on our backs. You know, yeah. we're going to score two points a night each. And we're just going to drag this team to the playoffs. But, but man, oh man, you put that team in a seven game series against any team that has a solid defensive structure. And I just have no confidence in that team to win a seven games. I have no confidence in them beating the Habs right now in a seven game series. Yeah, I have well, no Koskinen, confidence. Koskinen's not beating Price. Done. Exactly. Like, I right can't there, see them done. beating the Leafs. I can't even see them beating Calgary. To be honest with you. And and I don't even think Calgary is that great. I think Calgary is a solid team. And, you know, I kind of like the pieces that they have there. I think they're well balanced. But that's even a team that I could see the Oilers losing to in a seven-game series. And and that's just not good when you have two players like that. But I guess let's move on now, Lepore, to the Calgary Flames, who the Leafs closed out the week against. Yeah, fun game. Very solid 3-2 win. Jack Campbell... You know, comes in for Freddie Anderson. Freddie gets the night off, and and Campbell, unlike last season where Michael Hutchinson was a complete disaster, doesn't it feel good? <laughs> oh man, Leafs, it, Leafs fans, doesn't it feel good to have a competent backup goalie? That drove me fucking insane last oh, year. My watching God. Michael Hutchinson game in and game out, and you know what drove me nuts, Lapore? You know, everyone blaming it on the Leafs defense and saying, oh, they hung Hutchinson out to dry. When he's in net, they don't play as well as they do when Freddie's in. No, Hutchinson was just terrible. That's it. At some point, we just have to admit if a goalie isn't good. But at the same time, like with that Hutchinson thing, uh, I place a lot of blame on Dubas with that one. Because mm-hmm. like they bungled that one, like like they, they had McElhaney, a solid backup. They let him go, and then they addre- they thought they addressed the situation with Hutchinson, and he just wasn't good enough, and he wasn't proven in any way. So yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I'm gonna shit on the athlete, but like I'm gonna point to management as well. Like they could have done a way better job of figuring that one out, in my opinion, anyway. Yeah, no that 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 was definitely not managed well by Kyle Dubas, and, no, and you just man. knew going into the season it was going to be dicey last year having Freddie and Hutchinson as your one two, and it was kind yeah. of the same situation with the Habs where they had no one behind Carey Price. It was also a disaster for them. So yeah, bringing in Jack Campbell helps that team, but it's like you said, bringing in a backup that costs four to five million dollars yeah. isn't ideal, right? Yeah. So. So it, it, I, I really like the way that Jack Campbell has played. And even going back to last season, 
when Campbell came over in the trade. I mean, he's just been a really solid presence. And, and this is what I want from the backup goalie. I'm not saying you have to go in there and be as good as the starter. You don't have to go in there and shut teams out. Just, just do a solid job and don't get lit yeah. up. Yeah. Be reliable. And I, I think it's so important. And especially in a season like this, I mean, we've talked about it so many times, condensed schedule, a lot of back to backs, you're going to need your number two goalie to step up. So, so that was really good um, to see that from Jack Campbell. Any other overall thoughts in terms of, you know, lo- that Leafs and Flames game, Labor? Uh, not really. I, I think probably like a lot of people, I was running up and down because the uh, the NFC Championship game was uh, was on uh, was on TV at the same time. So I had two TVs going. I was running up and down the stairs. or people going back and forth. Uh, but I, I thought I thought they played well. I mean, the game could have went either way. Like you said, Campbell played well. The Leafs got three very weird goals. Like Muslin's goal, I think, went off someone. And then there was the Simmons one that he meant to pass it to Matthews and went in. Then the one went off Matthews. So like three weird goals. But the thing that's calming about a win like that is, number one, it's a, it's a road win. Number two, they because they didn't play well and they still won, it gives you a, go, a better feeling about the team. And like, these are the types of games in different ways that the Leafs wouldn't have won previously. Number one, because having not having a solid backup goaltender. And number two, is they, they just would like that late, that late push from Calgary, all that, like the Leafs would have found a way to lose. And I know that's kind of being like a predictor here, but I, I'm, it's just that feeling. And, and even when Calgary was pushing, I, I still felt like the Leafs were going to hold on. I, and and I, had, I haven't had that feeling in a long time. But just like in general, I think that game also kind of summed up the Leafs' defensive play. Like those nerves, like those same nerves aren't there that I had with the defensive group. And someone someone brought up a stat on Twitter. If I remember correctly, I think in the Leafs' first five games, their average shots against was 26. And it's been five years since the Leafs have had a five-game span where their average shots against was 26 or less. So even beyond it being like a, f- a five game span from this season, it's the first five games. So like, like to me, if there is anything Leafs fans can look at from the season so far and like the panic we had and the nerves we had, we talked about, we talked about in our season preview. If there's anything we could have point to, pointed to that we were afraid of, it was that. This team getting heavily outshot, getting in track meets, playing the wrong way that no one wants to see them play. This team is at least shown early on that they can play that way and they can win that way in a lower score scoring game, playing better structure and not giving us a heart attack every fucking night. I'll even go one step further with that shot stat you brought up, Lapore. I actually looked this up earlier today. And it's like you said, the Leafs for the longest time have been a team that just gives up a ton of shots, gets into track meets, just based on the way they play, right? They're an offensive run and gun sort of team. And we've been dying for them to show some more defensive structure. I have been so impressed with this defense core this year and a big part of that. And I know this stat doesn't show everything, but the Leafs are giving up less than 30 shots per game. And it's only been seven games, but they are giving up less than 30 shots per game for the first time since 2009, 2010. What? That is absolutely insane. And you can go look at that 9 10 season. They were terrible that season. I think they finished yeah. like 15th in the Eastern Conference. But for this team to go an entire decade where they have been one of the worst teams in the league in terms of giving up shots, and for them this year to be under 30 shots per game, and right now I believe they're they're eighth in the league in terms of shots per I was wondering, I was wondering where game. they actually said, like, like I said, I, I saw that. I'll check that. that. I saw that 26 the Leafs right yeah. now are yes, indeed. They are eighth in the league in shots against per game. So awesome. I've been really impressed with this defense core. And we've talked about this in the first two podcasts, bringing in TJ Brody to play alongside Morgan Riley. I, I love the way that Brody's been playing. I mean, yeah. I've, I've talked enough about Morgan Riley, but Brody's just been a solid presence. He's not making mistakes. And then that second pairing of Justin Hall and Jake Muzzin, Justin Hall, dude. So good, man. He's, again, like so good. Just, doing what he's doing, being fine. Again, like calming. I'm so impressed with him. Such a pleasant surprise this year, man. He may be like, to me, he may be like the, the pleasant surprise of the year so far for Leafs fans. 
like again just just being reliable and and he's like that that partnership with muzzin even too like something i think is not getting talked about enough is that's a lot of size like like on that second pairing and the leafs get shit on a lot for not having um enough grit and sandpaper and size and that kind of attitude but those two guys man like they take up a lot of space and they're not afraid to hit like even see the stuff after whistles that i love man like ah, i'm really starting to like that pairing really 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 fast yeah and and the thing with with that pairing for me is that they're just they're just going out there and not making any mistakes and just doing a really solid job because again in the past like we've talked about this before you had cody cc out there on the top pair with morgan riley you had martin marinson playing you know bottom pairing minutes and now instead of having martin marinson out there for 12 or 13 minutes a game you got travis dermott and zach bogosian and it's yeah. not like they're going out there and you know playing phenomenal hockey and you know contributing a lot offensively but they're just going out there and doing their jobs not turning the puck over they're moving the puck out of the zone efficiently and and i'm just really liking what i'm seeing and and you're seeing it in the in the statistics as well and i think one area where the leafs are struggling which is kind of crazy to say despite how great their power play has been is their five on five offense, Lapore? I mean, yeah. this is one of the most talented teams in the league. And despite how well the power play has been, been chugging along right now, at five on five, they're they're not where they want to be, and they're not where a lot of Leaf fans expect them to be. Yeah, I've seen a lot of people post things about the the underlying numbers and saying it, it should be just a matter of time. Like I think there was some stat among among players of a certain amount of shots. Matthews had like the worst shooting percentage in the league. And like, you know, eventually, as we all know, it evens out. But uh, I'm not, I can't say that. I think like most, most Leafs fans, because we've just seen that, we've seen that from them, that we're not too bothered by that. Because like the scoring will come. Like this, is, this has been a really good five on five unit for a few years now. So I don't think they just forgot how to score goals. I wonder if, it's, if what Keith is doing, and I can't believe I'm saying this. I wonder if what Keith is doing with the team early on, it's kind of like that Babcock thing in a similar way where it seemed like those Babcock seasons early on, the Leafs were playing 100 miles an hour, these like seven, five games, like just going absolutely bonkers. And then they would tighten up. It's like he'd, he'd step back and say, okay, I got to teach these guys how to play defense. And then they'd go totally boring for a few months. And then they'd kind of uh, hit their stride again offensively later in the year, or at least try to. So I wonder if Keith, at this point of the season is just trying to slow things down. And maybe he just has the opinion of like, okay, like I have this talent up front. These guys can score goals. Let's buckle down. Let's get everything comfortable in the back. And then the scoring will come naturally because that's where our talent lies. Like, I mean, I, I can't get in the guy's head, but I mean, from what I'm seeing, I wouldn't be shocked if that's where his perspective's at. No, that's a really good point because I would much rather this team be struggling a little bit five on five, but seeing on the flip side how well they're playing defensively and how for the first time in forever, it just seems like they're a well-structured defensive unit. They're not making, you know, the big mistakes that we've seen in years past. They're not giving up a ton of odd man rushes. And it's like you said, right? This team is talented and the scoring is going to come. Yeah. So even though they've been outscored 11 to 10, five on five, at some point that's going to flip yeah. because the scoring chances are there, the talent's there. And right now, if you can figure out a way to buckle down defensively, and learn how to play that style, which we've seen time and time again be successful in the playoffs. And again, I said this about the Dallas Stars, right? This is exactly the way that they played, you know, last season and even going back the last few seasons, right? Yeah. They, and the same thing with the New York Islanders. And listen, I'm not saying the Leafs are as great defensively as those teams were over the last few seasons, but you need to learn to play a similar type of style and I think when it comes down to the playoffs, one of the most important things is being able to play any type of style. So whether it's a tight game um, that you're hanging on late and you got to lock down defensively, or you do get into a run and gun sort of game against a high powered offense, you have to be able to be flexible. You have to adapt. You have to be able to, to win all sorts of games come playoff time. So I, I'm totally okay with the Leafs kind of struggling right now five on five and it's like you said Lapore. i think it's only going to get better as the season goes on yeah speaking of scoring 
and specifically power play scoring, little gluns for punishment trivia for you, Bruno. So in the last 10 years, I think it was in 10 years, maybe it was nine years, in the last nine or 10 years, easy answer for the first one. The player who scored the most power play goals is Ovechkin. Mm-hmm. In second, it's Stamkos. Can you guess who's third? Third? Off the top of my head, after those two guys, I, I would immediately just think of like another star over yeah. the last 10 years. Like, like a Panarin or something. Like, yeah, something one like of those that. guys. But Yeah. It's, dude, Wayne Simmons. <laughs> oh my goodness. Yeah, that one was that one was going around the other. Yeah, I couldn't believe it. I think it was 97 in, in the last like eight, nine or 10 years. Like unbelievable stat, but good for him. Good for him. We have high expectations, Wayne. High expectations on the power play now. The, the Wayne train is chugging along, Lapore. He's yeah. chugging along. Yeah. No, very but I mean, it, we, and we've talked about this before. He was a power play beast, you know, when he was in Philadelphia. But damn, I would have never guessed that he Crazy. was third on that list of the most power play goals over that stretch. Crazy. So a couple of seasons on the Leafs' third line, and you should have uh, some of the media calling for him to get in the Hockey Hall of Fame. It's easy. <laughs> there you go. Mm, yeah. They're, they're good at that in Toronto. All right, Lepore. Well, before we wrap things up here, any any last thoughts about the Leafs and uh, the upcoming week we have ahead here? Just uh, feeling good, man. Feeling good about the team. Like, good start to the season. In a short season, we didn't want to get off to a bad start because, again, like, you're going to run out of games quickly. And before you know it, it's going to be a, a points percentage thing where teams are going to be behind and there's not a lot of runway to make up ground. So it's, it's nice to see them get some points out of the way. They had that early loss to the Sens, and we all got a little nervous and freaked out with all the changes that things might not go well early. But they've buckled down, man. Like, we used it a lot in the last episode, talking about, you know, dialing in. And this team, they've I think they've dialed in right now, man. Like, I am impressed. I, I am impressed with the Leafs for sure. And I'm right there with you, Laporte. You know, it's like we said off the top of the show last week, we were pretty tough on this team because despite, you know, winning two out of their first three games, we were seeing a lot of the same things we saw carry over from last season, you know, offensively and defensively, they just weren't where we expected them to be. But after this second week to see them sitting there at five and two and to see what they've done on, on the defensive end and to see what they've done on the power play, and to see different guys contribute and to see how well the defense core is playing, it's I'm feeling good too. And yeah. and I think that this team just has to keep chugging along. And I'm, I'm sure there's gonna be points where they they throw out a stinker and you know they lose to a team they they probably should beat. That's gonna happen just like it happened, you know, in that senators game in week one. But for the most part, if the Leafs keep playing like this. At the end of the season, I, I think they're going to be either first or second in the Canadian division. So, yeah. so right now, things are looking good for the Toronto Maple Leafs. Yeah, they, they, and things, things, up, are okay, Lepore, things are okay in Leafland. <laughs> exactly. And coming up in week three, the Leafs play three games. They continue their road trip out west. They got the Flames on Tuesday. And then Connor McDavid and the Oilers on Thursday and Saturday. So we'll have lots to talk about. <laughs> oh man, I, I can't wait to see what happens in those Leafs Oilers. The, the, the Oilers are gonna fucking obliterate the Leafs just to uh, smack us in the face for all our comments. Yeah, it's McDavid awesome. and Drysdale are just gonna have like thirteen points combined yeah. in two. No, games. it's gonna be the opposite. It's gonna be Kyle Turris and Cassian and those <laughs> yeah. guys are just gonna be fucking going bar down everywhere. It's gonna just, be all their all their bottom six yeah. forwards just going ham on the Leafs, Koskinen, in couple shutouts. Yeah, just to make oh, us look bad early great. on. Yeah. All right. Well, that's going to do it for episode three of the Gluttons for Punishment podcast. Thank you so much for listening to us, whether it's on Apple or Spotify or wherever you get our podcast. We would really appreciate it if you subscribe to the show and leave us a five-star rating. And thank you so much for listening. And of course, watching us on YouTube as well. If you are watching us on there, thank you so much for the support. For Michael Lapore, I'm Anthony Bruno for the GFP podcast. We will see you guys in the next episode. See you later, everybody.